This podcast is brought to you thanks to the generous support of Whistler Blackcomb, leaders in delivering adventure. So we got a helicopter drop on the top of Mount Curry, you know, four inexperienced, full of full of excitement uh, males. And long story short, a friend of mine got caught in an avalanche and broke ribs and uh, he could barely breathe. It was like minus 20 out. We were very ill prepared. Um, in other words, I had one of those silver, you know, those silver crinkly blankets. <laughs> That's That was it. Welcome to Delivering Adventure. This is the podcast that explores what it really takes to share adventure like a pro with your friends, your family, and as a profession. My name is Chris Capio, and I'm coming to you from Whistler, British Columbia. And I'm Jordy Shepard, recording from Canmore, Alberta. After a lifetime of working extensively in different parts of the adventure guiding industry, Chris and I have teamed up to launch this podcast. In each episode, you will hear top adventure guides, managers, marketers, and athletes share their best stories, advice, and trade secrets. The goal of this podcast is to share how you can take yourself and others farther from the mountains to the office and beyond. We spent a lot of time talking about many of the components that go into delivering epic adventures, making good decisions, managing risk, improving performance, and keeping people motivated are all important pieces of delivering adventure. But how do we package all of this together? In this episode, we are going to focus in on how we should be designing our adventures to set them up for success. Joining us again is Chris Winter. Chris is the owner and founder of Big Mountain Adventures. Chris founded Big Mountain Adventures in 2002. During this time, he has built his tour company into the leader in guided mountain bike travel, featuring award-winning adventures in 14 countries. Chris is also a level four CSIA certified ski instructor who teaches and guides steep skiing clinics at Whistler Blackcomb for Extremely Canadian. Chris joined us earlier this season to talk about how he built his mountain bike guiding company, Big Mountain Adventures. In this episode, we go a little deeper into some of the things we can all be doing when it comes to structuring the adventure experiences we are delivering to others. At the end of this episode, we will summarize the key points from our discussion and close out the episode with a funny story from Chris. So make sure you listen right to the end. Here's Chris Winter. Awesome. Welcome back uh, for another episode, Chris. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you very much, Chris. So in our last episode, we talked a lot about your bike tour company, Big Mountain Bike Adventures. What types of other adventure experiences have you been delivering throughout your career? Like you've got a pretty broad uh, range of experiences that our audience probably doesn't realize. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, good question. And um, my, you know, I think my background is primarily in alpine skiing and I was a ski racer in Ontario and then, um, you know, uh, originally came out to Whistler for a summer ski camp, got a hooked as you do, and basically arrived here, you know, as an alpine skier and, um, and I was a ski instructor and a ski coach. And so that was a, that was a huge focus still is in my life. And so instead of following the ski coaching, um, you know, uh, path, which a lot of, a lot of people did that I was with at the time. Um, I decided to become a ski instructor at Whistler Blackcomb. And I eventually started working for Extremely Canadian, which is a very cool program here, uh, that focuses on, um, you know, steep skiing within bounds. And so I've been doing that for a long time, decades. And so I spent a lot of time, uh, on the mountain, uh, just showing people, kind of getting getting them out of their comfort zone, keeping them safe, and uh, you know, trying to find the best snow on Whistler Blackcomb. And I, uh, yeah, I've been doing that for a long time, and I I love doing it. So alpine skiing is kind of my my other passion besides mountain biking. And you've spent a bit of time in the ski film industry as well, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, after ski racing, ski instructing. Uh, I got my level four and then my level three coach, which was exciting at the time. And then I got into extreme skiing, which, uh, is now called free skiing, 
but back in the you know back in the 90s it was kind of um you know it was more more extreme uh skinny skis and and so on and uh competed in those events and for many years judged them for a while and then i became uh you know a sponsored free skier and had the you know amazing opportunity to travel a lot of places around the world and do a lot of heli skiing and um you know photography and cinematography and i had a few you know a few glimpses with some some movie movie segments which is uh which is really cool and then um yeah i've i you know i i'm i'm happy to say that i've re- remained fairly injury free through all the decades um and i'm uh, i'm still 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 enjoying shredding on skis yeah that that injury component and being healthy is uh something that i think that can fly under the radar but it is super important uh especially in in this industry to to be able to to be sustainable for sure i agree yes you've done and provided a whole bunch of different experiences to people around the world from biking to skiing do you have an example of a trip or an experience that you delivered that didn't go as planned? And if so, how did you handle it? Hmm. Wow. I mean, we've, um, you know, through Extremely Canadian, I have guided ski trips, um, you know, in the Alps. And then, you know, as a, as a, a professional skier, I've been on other trips to Alaska and uh, Kashmir, India, and a few other, you know, destinations. Um, but gosh, I'm trying to think, this is the question that, that we talked about previously, things that have, that went sideways. <laughs> and I don't know if it's what it is, but I can't really, I honestly cannot think of anything off the top of my head that's gone. I guess, I mean, one time in, I was up in Bella Coola, British Columbia, heli skiing. And the I mean, it's a crazy thing. It happens. The we were waiting for the helicopter to come pick us up. It never came. And it um we learned afterwards that it crashed, which was obviously very, very scary. Thankfully the pilot was fine. The helicopter was not. Um, but we were, you know, skiing down to tree line and getting ready to spend the night because we were realizing that we are not getting picked up. And so, um, but then finally a different helicopter emerged and we, we were able to get out of there. Um, so that's one, yeah, one close call. And actually I can think of another one now. Uh, you know, when I first came to Whistler, I was from Ontario and quite naive on the aspects of mountain safety uh, and actually, the technology wasn't very advanced back then in the early '90s. But we, you know, we went and did a, a heli drop on Mount Curry, which is the this beautiful, prominent peak above Pemberton, BC. And it's like I don't know. It's it's like looking up at Mont Blanc or something. It's just so stunning and so beautiful. Um, but we so we got a helicopter drop on the top of Mount Curry, uh, you know, for inexperienced full of you know full of excitement uh males and long story short a friend of mine got caught in an avalanche and broke ribs and we were on the back side of mount curry the cell phones didn't exist at the time just to give you some um you know perspective uh and so yeah so anyway i i was there with my friend patty patty k and uh he could barely breathe it was like minus 20 out. We were very ill prepared. Um, in other words, I had one of those silver, you know, those silver crinkly blankets. <laughs> That's That was it. And uh, yeah, and that was all I had for like the two of us to spend the night. And so the other two people in our group, they had to hike up and then ski down the north face of Curry, which is the the, the scary side that you see from the from the village. And meanwhile, I'm digging a snow pit you know, and getting ready to spend the night. And I, and it was minus 20, as I said, and it was in January. So the sun was kind of setting, you know, by mid afternoon, it was, it was like starting to look a bit like it was getting, you know, starting to get dark and cold. 
So it was really scary, to be honest, because, um, it, it, you know, long story short, the helicopter did come and, and, and pick us off the mountain. But had I had to spend that night with Patty, it, um, I'm pretty sure I would have lost toes because my ski racing ski boots were, you know, were, uh, didn't do any good. It was, yeah, we were, we were spooning in a very shallow snow cave when the helicopter came back. So yeah, that was, I mean, that was probably the, the closest I've been to, uh, you know, a really, yeah, scary situation, but um, that's all. That's about all I can think of now. I mean, I've had a few people get injured on Whistler Blackcomb guiding, but I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty risk adverse. Like, well, hold on. Let me just let me rephrase that. <laughs> my wife would disagree about my 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 <laughs> statement. I I love so I love adventure and I and I and I bring adventure on, but I I have a pretty good ability to kind of like read people. And, you know, and just kind of gauge the character, their experience. I mean, I, I think a lot of experienced skiers would be able to say this, but when I see somebody walk up to me in ski boots, holding their skis, you can kind of gauge a lot about, you know, their background right away, you know, just by the way they walk in the boots and then how they carry themselves. By the time you get off the lift at the top, um, you know, it's, and then you just kind of go one run at a time, making sure that they're able to do what you're, you know, proposing. And then you keep kind of pushing their comfort zone, and uh, and it's awesome. I mean, that uh, to it, what a treat to be able to, um, you know, share Whistler Black Home. And my job is to like get people out of their comfort zone. It's just it's the best. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, when you said, uh, yeah, that's about it as far as your stories, I think most people would think that that was pretty, yeah, that was pretty, pretty big challenges for sure. So that's, that's pretty crazy stories. Yeah. Um, what do your guests typically look like? And what do you think that they expect from, from the experiences? And, and, you know, we can broaden this out from, from skiing all the way to, to your bike tours and, and things like that. And, and you do seem to have a bit of a, a kind of a, a niche of, of very adventurous types of activities and, and people. So what do those people look like and what are they expecting when they come out to do a, to do an experience with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I, I, I think that, that the answer to that question is changing, um, you know, where it almost seems like with the advent of the internet and social media, um, uh, people, uh, you know, are, are, perhaps less less prepared for what they envision themselves doing in terms of an, uh, an adventure. And so, yeah, we've actually had a few people fall, I, I, you know, I call it like falling through the cracks in a way of our mountain bike trips in regards to them arriving to whatever the destination may be. And then they realize that this is not what they expected. And so, but they look the part, they speak the part, and uh, you know, and they passed our, you know, our vetting, our vetting process uh, in regards to making sure that they're prepared. But then they get there, and we're like, "Oh gosh, you're not prepared for for this." So, um, yeah, so it's it's a funny thing, and I think, you know, I, I you know, and, and on the mountain, on skis, on Whistler Black Home, where I think there's more, more and more of that you know, where people look the part, they talk the talk. But when it comes to actually, you know, skiing that steep line off the peak chair, uh, they're not there at all. So, you know, so I, I think it, it, it has gotten a little more complicated than it was, let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where it was like, okay, you and I both know what you're capable of um, on, on a mountain bike or on skis. But now it's like, it's difficult. People can, um, yeah, they can, uh, you know, they can give that in appearance like they know what they're doing. But when it comes down to the actual execution, it's not, um, it's not as easy as you think. Yeah, I, I do find that uh, skiing, especially at Whistler Black Home, which does tend to have uh, bigger and steeper terrain, you get people arrive and you ask them, what they do and and they'll say well i i've you know i've skied a black 
Yeah. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Like, wh- where was it? What did it look like? Like, did you ski it or did you just survive it? Did you do it more than once? Would you go and do it again? Did you, yeah. did you enjoy it? Was it groomed? Was it bumpy? <laughs> you know, and um, people, I do think that they do arrive with this expectation that can be a little bit different. And I find that you have to be a real investigator. I got burned. It was quite embarrassing, actually. I'll, t- I'll share the story. These yeah. four guys show up, and I think they were from maybe Alabama or something like that. And they were on a stag, and I had asked them. It was a beautiful sunny day, and I had asked them what they wanted to get out of our, our time together. And we just had a morning session. And they said, well, we want to get the best snow. We're, uh, you know, advanced skiers, and we want to get the best snow in Whistler. And so when you come to Whistler and you tell me that you're going to get, you want the best snow, you're thinking you want to get off the groomed a little bit and, and it's a sunny day. So we're going to go out to the farthest chair out, which is symphony. And so I go do a, a couple of warm up runs and I, and I had asked them if they'd been out late the night before. And they said, no, 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 went to bed early, got in, went to bed early. Okay. Well, that's cool. All right. So we'll go to, you know, go to a blue run warm up. Looks, everything looks good. Went up, did a run called the saddle, which at the time was steep, uh, uh, blue, the glaciers melted quite a bit now. So it's, it's, it is steeper, uh, mm-hmm. and it's more like a black, but, um, you yeah, know, went down there and the, the groom to be, he looked a little bit shaky, but he looked too, didn't look too bad. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't worried he was going to crash or get hurt or anything like that. And so we, we go back up the, the, the peak chair right to the top of Whistler mountain. And, and I figure, okay, well let's take them off the groom a little bit. And so I go over to this, this run and, um, it's ungroomed. It was called crescendo. If you know, uh, Whistler mountain and, it's not particularly steep. It's a little bit of new snow, a little bit rougher, but not bad. I would say the saddle is is far more intimidating. And three of the guys go cruising down, no problem. And the groom to be is is in the back, and yeah. it's like it's like he forgot how to ski or never knew. He yeah. crashed on every turn, every single turn. He would make yeah. a turn, and he would crash. And like yeah. when I say when I say he crashed on every turn, I don't mean like a third of the turns. I mean every turn. Wow. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? Like I've been teaching skiing for 28 years. How did I blow this? How did I not recognize that this guy is over terrain? And this doesn't make any sense with what I just saw on the saddle. And so by the time he got down to the bottom, he's exhausted. I basically dragged him out across the, the, uh, the bowl, which is, which if you know, the area is, is quite a long way. We get to, one of his buddies and and i'm thinking man what just happened here and his buddy gives him some water and he downs that and his buddy gives him some more water and it's like ah okay i get it now what you went to bed early yesterday not because you know you not because you didn't go drinking last night it's because you were drinking all day from <laughs> alabama when you got on the plane oh. got to whistler and you are super hungover, you're super dehydrated, and he was probably running on adrenaline for the first two, three turn, you know, runs, and then he yeah. just crashed and burned. And it was, the tank was empty and he was done. And it's yeah. funny how people can surprise you that way. And and just to your your point, another thing I find is, is as my guests get a little bit older, their risk tolerance is going down. Yes. So I've had people that were, were into the big runs and now they're they're pretty okay to not do the big runs anymore. And I have to adjust yeah. my, my mindset a little bit. I don't know if you're yeah. finding that. Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, on the mountain bike side with the, the trips that we run, we've, you know, from the very beginning, and it was more important back in the early days, 20 years ago, we really focused on experienced mountain bikers only. And, uh, you know, we've considered expanding to kind of include the new person to mountain biking, but then, but then circle back to no, 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 we need to focus on experienced mountain bikers only. And um, <clears throat> because it's a, I don't know, it's a slippery slope. It's uh if you start getting into like the masses, in other words, people that see, you know, they see mountain biking in car commercials, and you're like, wow, honey, we should, you know, we should do that mountain biking thing, you know, or, or we could go rafting, you know, that kind of notion. <laughs> And I'm like, you know, when we, when we talk about this, uh, you know, as a team at, at our company, it's, uh, I, I think it's important for us on those week long adventure trips, just to focus on the core mountain biker. And by whereas, whereas when you're, you know, on Whistler Blackcomb and you've got a group of people for one day, 
you can kind of, yeah, it, it's, um, it's easier to be able to open up to, uh, the, the soft adventure types or, you know, what's adventure for me is different for, you know, other, other people or for us. So, um, but it's easier on the controlled environment of Whistler Blackcomb versus, you know, a week long mountain bike holiday somewhere. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you, you raised a really good point, right? Like adventure can be a little bit different for you than maybe other people. So what yeah. do you think adventure is for the bulk of the people that you're, you're guiding and teaching? Yeah, well, that's, that's the perspective part, right? Um, and so I do think, you know, mountain bikers inherently love adventure. And so <clears throat> that's, that could be just riding your back, right, bar, ba, excuse me, your backyard trail after work that you ride two or three times a week. Uh, that is adventure because things can happen. Or, you know, is it going to Bhutan and, um, and riding into a village that has barely seen, you know, anybody uh, from, from the outside, you know, outside of that world. So, um, you know, it's adventures, you know, the definition is different for all of us. And I guess what I've tried to do with the mountain bike trips is, you know, share what I, I think I have a, I have a pretty high, you know, what, what I consider to be adventurous might be quite a, really adventurous for most people. And that's, um, you know, kind of what we've, what we've done. And then we've tried to dim, dim it down a little bit over the decades so that it's a bit, a bit more um, palatable for, for more people. So our, our sort of our focus on this episode is how we can build better adventure experiences. And, and one mistake that I see people make is not reading their audience very well. And I'll give you an example. I, I knew a guy who had, uh, I spoke to him and he had told me that he had a, a hiking tour company and he was offering all of these trips. And so I said to him, I said, well, wow, that's, that's amazing. Just out of curiosity, what do your guests look like? Like, what are they interested in? And his response was, I don't know. <laughs> and yeah. so he had built his business around what he wanted to do and the experiences that he had wanted to deliver mm. as opposed to figuring out what people might want to do and focusing in on that. And so, you know, my question is, you know, how important is it to understand what your guests or participants are going to want to do? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most important thing, arguably. Um, and I think I was like your friend or that person uh, for the first 10 years of running even more, 15 years. And I basically created trips in the Alps that, I wanted to do, which was the, you know, the toothbrush and the backpack type of notion where you're spending nights in Alpine huts and, um, going point to point. And so, um, but there were people that wanted to join me on that, on that journey. And then, you know, as, <clears throat> as the, as the company evolved and I brought some smarter people than me, uh, onto the team, we started to kind of like dissect obviously more like, okay, what, what, who are these people that want to come on these trips? And yeah, you're hundred percent correct. You want to, you know, if you know your clientele, then you can create, um, you know, an experience, um, to suit. And that's everything from, you know, their age and their sex and where they live and how many times a week do they ride their bike? Um, so yeah, we've, you know, every year or a couple of years now we do a survey, um, with our, you know, with our clients and um, try to get an idea of, you know, what what level of hotel do they do they appreciate? Um, do they like moving night after night? How many hours a day do they want to ride? And uh, you know, now there's the e bikes versus regular mountain bikes. So we kind of, yeah, we canvas people um, and try to figure out uh, what you know what's the ultimate mountain bike holiday, and then go from there. So one of the key elements to achieving an adventure is the storytelling element. Ultimately, an experience only becomes an adventure if people see it as being a positive experience afterwards. This means there has to be some degree of having fun. 
depending on how you measure fun, there's a scale that we can use that has three types of fun. So type one fun is fun when you're doing the activity. Type two is not fun in the moment, but is appreciated afterwards. And definitely the memories help with the fun factor. And then type three is just not fun, either during or after the activity. Yes. So when it comes to delivering adventure, ultimately the goal is to deliver type one and two fun for us as guides and instructors and, and business owners. When you're designing your trips and courses, what kind of consideration goes into managing the experiences so that you are delivering enough type one and two fun? And does this change based on your clients? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, and I, I think I have a tendency, uh, historically, I'm more of a type two. I, I lean towards type two. And, um, but... So that's kind of always been, you know, sprinkled into the experiences that, that we create and, 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 and sell. Um, but there's no question that not everybody um, leans towards the type two type of experience. It's a, it's a fine line, right, between type two and type three fun. Yeah. I, here's the thing. I think when you go on an active holiday and I sell and create mountain biking trips, um, it's there, there, there's some challenge involved in these trips and it's just kind of like, okay, you're on a bicycle, there's a hill, you know, it's raining out, uh, it's cold and you know, all of that stuff is kind of makes it all, uh, you know, it's a type two experience. It's just, it's, you know, you're not going on a all inclusive holiday which would be kind of like you're not lounging by the pool. Totally. That's the type one. That's strictly type one. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it, you're, you're, you're always, you're, I, I just, the, the nature of a mountain bike holiday and a mountain biking experience is that there's always type two involved. It's just what mountain bikers do. And so you're just kind of managing the, how much type two is going to be, um, you know, how much type two is going to be, uh, a part of each day in terms of your holiday. And so, right. so the, uh, the apportioning of it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, the, your, your, your beer or, uh, or lemonade at the end of the day just tastes that much sweeter, you know, after a, a, a good, long, challenging day on the mountain bike. And so I think, you know, and I, and I, the, the, the trips that are even, you know, harder on the type two, or I should say more focused on the type two tend to be the ones that resonate 10 years later. And, um, they're memorable, they're memorable, you know, when you really get out of your comfort zone and you hunker down, you know, and it's not, not to say that all of our trips are like death marches, but, um, I, I don't know, I think it's important and we're all, I think we, uh, in the Western world, you know, our lives are all so, um, Everything's become so easy now. You know, you can have a coffee delivered to your front door. Your car is self-driving. It's like there's an app for everything. So I think there's, we've talked about this before on the show, okay. and it's we're we're in a comfort kind of culture. Yes, not everywhere in the world. We're actually pretty fortunate to be in that, and yes. uh, but it also creates a certain amount of of slackness and. Uh, lack of discomfort leads to wanting more discomfort more or less discomfort right and uh, and more comfortableness and we we get a bit you know as a culture a bit soft in the end right and so th these are opportunities for people to actually push themselves a little bit and and be pushed by you to as as their guide instructor to the kind of the not their limit but you know to where where you know they can go to yes and they're not sure maybe if they can go to there and afterwards it's it's just incredibly memorable yeah. and this is a product right it's 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 a thing that you're creating for them yeah. and if it's memorable there's value to that yeah. if it's not memorable and it go it just goes away and gets deleted out of their repertoire of you know memories and stories and um the photos you know if, if they took photos are not really standing out to them anymore and they don't revisit them, then there's really no value yeah. for them. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I find, you know, one of the most interesting kind of case studies for me is when I hear somebody, you know, that's just come home from a trip 
they might see a friend and I'm just kind of listening, uh, you know, on the periphery, but it's like, okay, how was your trip? And those three things that come out of your mouth, the first things that come out of your mouth are, you know, th those, I'm always curious to hear what people have to say and, or, or, you, you know, your day on Whistler Black Home skiing with, you know, being guided around or, you know, and, and so those are the things that we, that I, I find I I'm trying to, you know, to replicate or create in the trips. And it's often people you meet, it's unplanned, uh, impromptu type experiences, you know, like, uh, if you're in Morocco, the unexpected. yeah, the unexpected things, you know, or things that you couldn't reproduce on your own. So if we were to view an adventure experience through the lens of pacing of challenge, what would that look like? So for example, if we're looking to deliver the optimal experience, how much challenge should be, you be striving to expose people to at the start, the middle, and the end of a, a trip or a day? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, it's a good question. You know, I think I, I, the easiest way for, to, for me to answer that is, you know, as a ski guide on Whistler Black Home with Extremely Canadian, where I'm in a controlled environment. I mean relatively controlled there's a lot of uncontrolled aspects of being on a huge mountain in the snow in the winter but from my perspective when i'm getting off a chairlift i can you know i can take people on a graduation of difficulty uh relative to the conditions so you know there's the obvious right you warm up a couple of warm-up laps and then you know and then as the day or day two days progress you've kind of you know you up the the level of challenge and so um but it's it's a that it'd be a different answer i think on a mountain bike uh if you were on a multi-day trip where it's more about pacing yourself and not you know not uh i guess there's there's more of a physical aspect to to a cycling trip versus alpine skiing uh which is more just kind of like you know, steeps and getting out of your comfort zone that way on a bike, you need to keep some energy in the tank for the coming days. And so, um, I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that there's like a, you know, a warm up. there might be a bit of a warm up day, but then you're, you kind of dive in to making, cause you're fresh. Hopefully, hopefully the jet lag is, is not affecting you too much. And, uh, you know, you can kind of like dive into, you know, we find five or six days in a row, big days in a row, are kind of like a, a you know happy place for for a mountain bike holiday. In the gravity kind of adventures, if you can do it, and you can't always do it, but ending on a downhill is often nice, right? In terms of pacing, and you know, you so can get you get the big climb out of the way. And then there's the the inverse of that, like if you're in the Grand Canyon and you're doing a trip oh, yeah. and you go down, 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 right? The the down is optional, but the up is mandatory. Yeah. And yeah, it's it can be really difficult, right? Because you kinda you kinda end with with the the suck. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's that's a good example, the Grand Canyon. Um I've I by the way, I barely I once barely made it back up to the rim because I was young and naive and I'm like, Oh yeah, no problem, I can do this. And it was I was, it was hard, mega hard, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. And you're committed. Yeah, that's right. There's nowhere to go. Um, <laughs> as the vultures circle above you watching you, uh, no, but you're, yeah, you're a hundred percent correct. I mean, for the, for the holidays that we're designing, you definitely want to end on a high note, preferably with a downhill, <laughs> which is actually a, which is actually a low place. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> and you know, yeah. like for hel helicopter assisted ski touring, yeah. the, the idea is to get dropped as high as possible at the start of the day and you do a descent and then you tour up and down and up and down, whatever you do, but finish as low as possible at the end of the day to get picked up. Yeah. There's no question that there's a, um, you know, there's the perfect formula in regards to um, making sure that people end on a, on a positive note. Right. And then I guess the other, the other piece is preparing them for what it's going to look like so that they can, they can manage themselves a little bit too, for the pacing as a, uh, you know, you know, if, if you've done the trip or you've, you've planned the trip, yeah, you know, what's coming up, but they don't, yes. right. It's a classic kids in the car. Are we there yet? 
that's, kind of thing, right? That's, and the, the answer is sometimes, yeah, we're close, but you're actually not that close. <laughs> or <laughs> or you you are not that close um, and you're saying, yeah, we're we're pretty close, yeah. right? Just keep them going. Yeah, I know. That's, yeah. And that's a classic guides move, right? You're like, you t- tend to say that it's not that far, but it actually is quite far. <laughs> And yeah, reminds- but you can you can only play that card so many yeah. times in so many places, and then you lose yeah. trust. Yeah, and that re- that reminds me of a funny um, a funny story. Like when we started running mountain bike trips in Nepal, um, over ten years ago, the Nepalese and I didn't know this uh, uh, back then, but they they generally they don't like to let you down in terms of you know, telling you that there's a massive climb to be had. So, and that's just the culture. And that's kind of, um, and I'm probably perhaps not explaining it as clearly as it could be explained, but they, uh, they, they don't like being the bearer of bad news. So they don't, like, they don't yes, tell you. Exactly. And so we had a few trips back in the early days where, you know, the North Americans were like, okay, we need to know exactly and some mountain bikers uh, are very technical in terms of like meters up and down and how long is this and that. And I'm more about just, you know, let it unfold and I'll let, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll deal with it. But some people like to know exactly what they're getting into. But it was a funny, yeah, funny relationship between the Nepalese guides and some of the North American mountain bikers that we, uh, we had on our trips. So how has technology affected how you design your adventures? Because you've been doing this for quite a while since you were essentially been involved with it since you were a young child. And like you said, born into it yeah. and technology has changed. Oh my God. And so how, yeah, how, how has that affected you in terms of creating the, the adventures? Well, it's, it's funny. Um, I have to, I have to share like, cause my, my mom and dad started running road cycling trips in 1972 and so in 1972, the fax machine did not exist. And yeah, so as a kid, you know, I'd be coming home from school and my mom would have to stop at the telex office and uh, we'd sit in the car and she'd run in and she would send a, you know, send a telex to a hotel in France. And then a week later, we'd go back into the telex office and kind of get the message back, you know, that the hotel was booked. Um yeah, and they and they book, you know, they they designed their trips on, you know, with with books. Um, and there were some, you know, I think the the British Cycle Touring Association would have been kind of like the the very first cycling information you could get. And then, you know, Michelin guides and Michelin maps. And um, so there was a lot of work done. And and then the facts came out and that got a little easier for my mom and dad. But there were no cell phones. So my, you know, and they barely speak, you know, German, Italian, French. And so it's just, I can't, can't even believe what they dealt with. Um, you know, and their trips were like three weeks, a month long. So yeah, the potential for things to go sideways, uh, is, was, you know, was huge back for their trips. Yeah. Yeah. Lack of communication, lack of knowing exactly where you're going sometimes, but you, you would have skills. Yeah, and you'd have to pull those skills out to navigate and make your way through. Yeah, so they they'd provide uh, riders with like a, a paper route route description, and then here's your map, and basically no nobody was allowed to ride alone, so you had to be in pairs uh, or a group, and you'd just have to be at the hotel before dark in the next town, and it might be eighty kilometers away, and so yeah, people would have to stop at a cell, you know, you sorry not a cell phone, use a you know pay phone or go into a shop and call the hotel or it, you, you'd have to carry stuff. change with you to use a payphone. <laughs> yeah. You know, French, and it was obviously all the currencies were different back then. Um, and so, yeah, now, Oh my gosh. Like I, the way I describe it is you can literally plan your trip on your cell phone and, um, you can book your hotel, you can look at your routes, book your transfer. So yeah, from a but the the beautiful thing about it is yeah. like I was just uh, on the Bodioho uh, ski tour for four days, three nights okay. over the Wapped Ice Field wow. in the Rockies. Yeah, and uh, my brother's a ski guide, and he was along on the trip, and he was leading through uh, an ice fall, and so we, you know, we had all the maps downloaded, we had paper maps, 
but the reality is it was kind of right right the visibility got poor right when we were going through a piece of the ice fall okay. and you just have to you have to go you just have to walk and the terrain presents itself yes and but because the crevasses yeah don't show up on the maps yeah even even on the digital maps that you have and even if you have high resolution imagery it's still it doesn't replace actually looking with your eyes and pulling your probe out and being and roped safe. up for safety. And, yeah. and it's, it's full on adventure. Yes. And so despite the technology, it, you still have to use your, your common sense and actually just move through the terrain. Yeah. Yeah. And no, that's a really good, it's a really good point. I, 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 I guess at some point the technology, you know, it only goes so far. And, uh, and I find, you know, on our mountain bike trips, it's like, it's when things, you know, when things become adverse, um, like, as you said, the visibility or the rain or snow or wind or cold is when you start having to real, you know, you realize that the apps aren't going to help you. <laughs> and so, yeah, or the, the bridge is out or there's a, there's new trails and you kind of get lost in the intertwinedness of it. And yeah. you're not exactly sure where you are and it's not showing up on your map. Yeah. or on your on your gps or your your cell phone app right yeah so you've got a, um yeah yeah or or you did not download or you thought you downloaded the map set ahead of time and now you're out of cell service and you just don't have that available to you and you gotta yeah you gotta use okay, your skills so. and do the best you can yeah no and i think it's um you know i i, I i'm a little afraid of um you know humanity in a way and that people are just becoming a little out of touch with, um, you know, with having to, you know, pick up their own socks, so to speak, and kind of like just the street, you know, street skills of, I, I call it street skills, but it's really just uh, common sense. People are, are uh, sure. lacking a little bit as, as technology invades every piece of our lives. We're, we're unable to kind of deal with, um, you know, with just seemingly fairly common sense things and uh yeah so when we when we have people high in the mountains uh around the world on, a, on these mountain bike trips it's we kind of need everyone to be self-sufficient to a certain degree you know or any guide would be so it's um yeah it's an interesting yeah, and really really encourage uh communication just because they might see something that you as a leader does not see that's true. And that's true. And you're, you're cruising along and, and someone says, Hey, you, you went right. And maybe, maybe the signs seem to say, mm. go left. Or I, it seems like we're going down right now and we should be going up. Yeah. And it's kind of like, yeah, I, I appreciate you yeah. mentioning that. Yeah. No, I agree. And I yeah. find that especially, especially true in the snow, you know, when you're in the mountains and I find it's important when you're in a snow environment, uh, you know, to be, to be speak out, and communicate as a group and um, not just rely strictly on a guide, you know, especially with snow stability and safety of moving through the mountains. Yeah. Where there's all those unpredictable um, aspects, right? So when it comes to designing adventure experiences for either friends or family or professionally, is there anything else that you think people out there should know? I, I just, I just encourage, I really do I encourage I think I think adventure is so important. You know, we as we just talked about in 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 light of the fact that everything is so easy around us now. And so uh it's important to keep adventure happening with kids and you know and families and friends and just um not not to become too comfortable. And that, that's just me though. I I I think it's I love getting out of my comfort zone and um and as you know as we talked about too it's not it's not doesn't have to be getting on a plane and going to some foreign country it could be just in your backyard and it also spills over into the other parts of your life when you're not adventuring if you have had these experiences let's say type two fun yes. and it's memorable but um you know maybe was challenging at the time then when you re when you see these other challenges in in other parts of your life with family or work or um, all that other kind of thing that can, you know, financially, whatever challenges that all affect us, you can actually kind of sit back and say, you know what, I, I can get through this because I could get through that. Yeah. Oh yeah. hundred percent. 
hundred percent. And one of one of my favorite parts of travel is is coming home. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a homebody. Uh, I really love being home, but I also really love it's it's weird. I'm passionate about being away, but I love being home. And I and I think, you know, one of the best parts of travel and getting out of your comfort zone is like returning and having that renewed perspective. Um, you know, and everything's just a bit sweeter, you know, if you've had some some challenges in life. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, Chris. And uh yeah, we'll uh we'll look to follow you in your adventures uh, on, online and uh, yeah, and through your business activities. Wonderful. Well, thanks very much, Jordy. And uh, thanks for having me. And it was, it was a pleasure. If you'd like to find out more about Big Mountain Adventures, you can visit ridebig.com. We have posted the link in our show notes. We have also posted links to the Braylorn Adventure Lodge and Zero Ceiling, which Chris Winter has also been heavily involved in. So Jordy, what were your takeaways from this discussion? How should we be designing our adventure experiences? Well, Chris, let's recap a quick few points. First step is to know your audience. Who are you actually building your experiences for? What are their needs, interests, and capabilities? The second step is to align expectations early. This means ensuring everyone knows what they're getting themselves into. This includes aligning goals, identifying risk tolerance, and addressing needs, and so on. The third thing to remember is that it has to be about them. There are experiences that guides, instructors, and companies may want to deliver, and there are experiences that people want to experience. These two things are not always the same thing. If you want to be successful, build experiences that people want to do. Yeah, good point, Jordy. Adding on to this, figuring out how much challenge is needed is imperative. We talked about the type one, two, and three fun. Type one fun, of course, is fun in the moment. Type two fun may not be fun when you're doing it, but it will be viewed as being enjoyable and worth it afterwards. And type three fun are experiences that are never seen as being fun at all. The best adventures involve type two fun. As Chris Winter touched on, Adventures that revolve around type 1 fun probably aren't really adventures at all, as there won't be any challenge. When we're building experiences, we need to make sure we know what people can tolerate, as not everyone wants type 2 adventure either. The other thing to remember is that people probably don't want type 2 fun the whole time. This is where pacing and challenge become so important. As Chris shared with us, when it comes to designing adventures, we want to ease into it, build in the challenge in the middle, and finish with flow. This allows people to warm up and then consolidate their experiences at the end. Good point, Chris. The last point I would add in here is always remembering that the goal of adventure is to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone. Adventure is important, and sometimes we can forget why it is so valuable. Yes, adventure is often fun but it serves a pretty important role in our lives. This makes the ability to deliver adventure a key life skill to have. Now over to you, our audience. What were your key takeaways? Are there some elements of designing adventure experiences that we missed? We would love to hear from you. You can find us through any of our social media feeds or through our email. All of these are listed in the show notes. Before we go, we have one last funny story from Chris Winter. Thanks for listening. Not long ago, you know, I've taught a lot, of, taught skiing a lot over the years, coached, taught. Um, and I've had a few, some of my most memorable seasons have been like coaching kids uh, and specifically like the, you know, 11 to 13 year old group. It seems to be a, it's a, it's a wonderful age. And, um, you know, I've created lifelong friendships with uh, these kids, you know, that I, that I coached in Ottawa and New Zealand and here in Whistler. And, um, you know, one of my, when I go up the peak chair in Whistler on Whistler mountain, I always look down at the, the coffin, which is kind of one of the signature black diamond, triple black diamond lines. It really is scary, but I always think to myself, yeah, I've skied that in jeans, <laughs> which is just a little something. Cause I, you know, my, my, the, the group that I was teaching a few years ago, uh, yeah, we all skied it in jeans and that was something that I, I'm sure not, not too many people have actually skied that line, but let alone in jeans. 
<laughs> so, right. Yeah. So yeah. just anytime you go buy it now totally. or you're on it, yeah. you just have that, that uh, comedic that, uh, that picture of yourself. Yeah. And I mean, it's, you got to have fun doing everything, frankly, not, not take it too seriously. No, exactly. No, there's no point in being too serious about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> unless things are going sideways and then take it quite seriously. Yes. yes. Unless the jeans get wet and the wind picks up and all of a sudden they're frozen <laughs> <laughs> against your legs, then you're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Then head to the chalet for a cappuccino. That's right. That's right. <laughs>